Well, I hope everyone had a good uh, 4th of July week and were refreshed by just a time to kick back a little bit and enjoy life, maybe a few hamburgers or steaks on the grill and those kinds of things as well. But uh, we are in a, a summer series called Anchored. And I thought that this would be a good series for this summer just because it's always good to reconnect with some of the, the foundational beliefs that we have as followers of Christ. Uh, but also it just gives us some flexibility this summer as we have uh, special sermons and other events taking place. And so I, I hope you appreciate the opportunity to go back and to revisit some things you may know about very well, you may need to be reminded of, or it may open up some understanding that you just had as gaps in your, in your walk with the Lord. And today we're going to be talking about Jesus and the fact that we are anchored in the Savior. And it doesn't get much more basic than that, being anchored in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, as I think about Anchorage and, and ships, lots of, of stories come to mind. So I just wanted to share something that happened to Jane and I several years ago. I think it was back about 2014 or 15. We were over in Cape Charles for a tall ship. Uh, I don't know what you call it. It's not a fly-in when you have ships, a, a float-in, I suppose. And uh, we just enjoy watching tall ships. And, and, of course, Cape Charles is a nice place as well. But as we were in the, the shanty, which is the, the grill there on the water, all of a sudden some dark clouds began to form, and there was this, this huge storm that came into Cape Charles. And at the very same time, there was a big tall ship that was coming into Cape Charles. And uh, this is a picture of the, the very ship that we saw. This isn't the day of the storm. But uh, the ship had just begun to come out of the river into the little inlet there Cape Char out of the bay into the little inlet there at Cape Charles and uh, he was doing his best to, to make sure he made it before the storm became fierce but as he was coming near the dock the wind started to pick up the, the rain was just torrential and we were watching from the window of the shanty and the wind was blowing hard against the windows and beating hard against the windows and so we watched this drama as it played out and there were three shoremen or dockmen that were trying to help this ship and it was headed straight for the dock, and then just at the last minute it was able to turn, and it was rocking, and the wind was blowing. And somehow that ship's captain and the three dock workers were able to pull that boat alongside and to, to tie it off, to moor it off to the dock. It was a close call as far as I'm concerned, but maybe they were so experienced they'd seen that sort of thing before. So whether you are, are anchored or whether you are secured to a dock, there is something about knowing that you have safely made it into the harbor and you are secure in the midst of a storm. And so that's what I'd like you to think about today as we talk about being anchored in the Savior. Last week we talked about being anchored in the Creator. And we said that that helps us know who we are. And uh, we are created by God in His image. And certainly uh, we know who we are because we are saved by Christ. But I think when we think of our relationship with Christ, we do think of, of that storm of life because after Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden of course sin came into the world and from that point on there have been a lot of storms in humanity there have been physical storms and there have also been human storms where people have risen up against people and uh, there have been murders and all kinds of sin that have entered into the human race and what that has resulted in is an atmosphere of chaos and sometimes trouble even in our own soul that needs to be settled. And so this anchorage that we have in Jesus, I think is what we need in a chaotic world, in a chaotic time, sometimes as chaos is even churning around in our, our very hearts. So we're gonna go to a passage of scripture to look at Jesus, our anchor, that we may not always go to. It's in the book of John, and it's in that wonderful first chapter where John talks about Jesus as the word uh, the word becoming flesh. But there's a, a great section of that passage that I think really helps, helps capture what it means to be anchored in the Savior. So I'd like you to turn with me to John chapter 1, and we're going to be reading verse 11 through verse 13. Right? And here's, here's what John writes. He says, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, 
but born of God. And so that obviously talks about coming to Christ and finding salvation in Him. But we're going to break that down and see some of the different aspects of being anchored in the Savior. So as you think of the different ways in which chaos comes into your life, also think of how Christ, the one in whom you are anchored, helps you navigate those times and keeps you firmly anchored. So first of all, I think it's important to realize that we choose Jesus as our Savior. And if we go back to this passage that we just read, just uh, verse 11, notice that it says, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, those that were his own, I believe that's referring to the Jewish nation. Because they were the ones who had been chosen by God uh, through Abraham and the Old Testament. They were the ones out of which the prophets had come and foretold that the Messiah would come. Uh, you had the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling council of the Jews. And you had scholars such as Pharisees and Sadducees who were, were really narrowed in on and, and, and keen on this Messiah and what he would look like and what he would do when he came. And so the Messiah came, which was exciting, he came to his own, the very people who had been called by God, out of which the Messiah would come, but they did not receive him. Now, it's, of course, very important to remember that there were Jews who did receive Jesus, and Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> so this is not an indictment on, on the whole Jewish race at the time. Uh, there was Nicodemus, who evidently was, was likely a member of the Sanhedrin, and he was attracted to Jesus. He might have actually become a follower of Jesus. We're not sure. All of the disciples were Jewish. So this isn't to say that every Jewish person in the world into which Jesus came rejected him. But those who had spent their lives trying to gain knowledge about who the Messiah would be, those who were the upper echelon of, of the spiritual leaders of the day who should have received him gladly and embraced him, they didn't receive him. But those who did receive him were those who believed in him. Now, what that means to me is that John is saying our salvation comes by choice and not by heritage. In other words, we don't receive forgiveness of our sins based on who our parents were or our grandparents were or our great-grandparents were. We receive it upon our own choice to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So I thought it might be good just to, to look at three passages of Scripture. And again, you may be very familiar with these passages, but they just remind us of the dilemma that we have before we accept Christ, uh, the situation that we're in, and then what God has done for us to offer salvation to us through Jesus Christ. So the first passage is very short. In Romans chapter 3, 15, uh, Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so the problem with the human race is that we have rebelled against God, uh, we have sinned against God, and so we have fallen short of his glory. That's the, the human predicament, if you will. And then in Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul gives a great description of what it's like to be in darkness, to be in a place where we're out of fellowship with God. And here's, here's what he says. He says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, who, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. And so the human predicament was that because of sin in the world, we, we fell short of the glory of God when we sinned and were led away by temptation. And as a result, we were drawn into this dark place and we were children of wrath. We were in the crosshairs of God's wrath because we were out of fellowship with him and we were in disobedience to him. But then the good news is right after that in Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 5. And, and, and this is one of those passages when you really absorb it, it, it is a beautiful very encouraging passage. Here's what it says. But because of his great love for us, right? So things were bleak. We were living in darkness because of sin. But because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ 
even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Right? Just an extremely important series of scriptures. Now, I want to just think a little bit about this idea that we choose Jesus. Why would we not choose Jesus? Uh, we were dead in our transgressions. We were in darkness. God's offering this way out of darkness. And because of his rich love and mercy, he wants to save us through the sacrifice of his son because Jesus' blood washed our sins away at Calvary and paid our debt, and we receive him to receive that salvation. Why would we not do that? And I think there's one word, at least in my mind and experience, that stands in the way of receiving this great gift that God gives us and choosing Jesus. And I would ask you what that one word is, but there might be several that you would come up with. Just kind of think for a moment what you think the word is. The word is pride, right? Pride. Why would you not accept something that's good for you, that you need, that's going to save you? I think pride is the reason why. Because pride has a way of, of, of puffing up our inner person to the point where we don't think we need what we need. And we think we can settle things ourselves, and we don't need any outside help to take care of our problems. Now, I had an experience yesterday that I'm a little embarrassed to share with you, but I'm going to go ahead and share it just because it, it shows you my human pride. Uh, we had some, some trees in our backyard many years ago, and we had them removed. And over the years, little, little cavities have developed under the ground because, I don't know, maybe they backfilled too much of the, the trash from, from the uh, stump grinder in there, or maybe the trees are just rotting away. But, we, it, but it just keeps slumping. And so every three or four years, I have to put dirt in these cavities so that my, my yard is level. Well, that happened yesterday. I went to get some dirt, and I started poking around, and I found two really deep cavities in the, in the ground. So I took the, the ray candle, and I just kind of poked it down in those holes, and it went down about a foot and a half to two feet, and, and I kept poking until I got to the bottom, and then I filled it with dirt and just kept tamping the dirt down so that the holes were filled, and then I laid dirt on the top. That sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds successful. I did what needed to be done. But then as I started to mow the grass... All of a sudden, I, I felt a sting on my arm. And I, I looked down, and there was, there was a yellow jacket stinging me. And so I brushed it off, and, and I thought, man, where did he come from? Right? Uh, just some random, random wasp that wanted to sting me. So I went inside, kind of nursed it a little bit, and, and thought, well, that's just kind of an anomaly, and so I'll go back out and finish the yard. So I, I, I mowed again, and I came back around to this dirt area, where I had poked the hole in this cavity. And just as I got past that, I felt more stings. <laughs> and, and this time there were, there were three, one on my foot, uh, one on the back of my leg, one on my back, and I went into the garage as quickly as I could. I ran away from this place and just started, this is kind of, this is bad, but I, I started taking my clothes off, all right, uh, in the garage, just trying to get rid of, of whatever this was on my clothes. And, I, and there were bees on my clothes. Have you ever... Do you know that? They stay on your clothes. And, and so I guess their stingers get stuck in, in the material. So, so I was just stepping on them and hitting them with brooms and getting them out of the garage. And, and so finally I felt safe. And I went in and regrouped a little bit. And, and yet there was still a little bit left of, of my yard. And so um, I thought, well, now what should I do? Do I leave the yard in mode? Uh, or do I, do I go ahead and brave it? Uh, because what are the chances of, of them attacking me again, right? So I went out, started to mow again, went past the part where the dirt was, and lo and behold, here they come again. So they start stinging me again. And I got stung three more times. I ran into the garage, took my clothes off again, and started uh, stomping on the bees that were still there. And I came in, regrouped, and finally this time there was just one little strip left. And so I, I braved the yard, went out, ran across the yard with the mower, got that one strip, ran around to the garage, and there were no bees that got me that time. Now, I, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, this morning I'm really sore. <laughs> yeah, the stings don't hurt, but my, but my joints are, are sore. But why, why did I do that? Uh, the grass wasn't that high. It could have waited until I got an exterminator there this week and finished it. It was because something kind of welled up inside of me that made me angry at these bees. Maybe not as angry as they were at me for, for messing up their home, but, but angry. And by golly, they weren't going to get the best of me. And so pride 
caused me to get stung at least six more times than I should have yesterday. And I thought how much that's like our effort to save ourselves spiritually. Pride gets in the way of the obvious solution that God has provided. And it's interesting because the things that we do pridefully aren't, aren't always bad things. For example, uh, we might attend church. That's a good thing. The Bible tells us, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Uh, we read the Bible. That's a good thing. God's word needs to be buried in our heart. We do good deeds. That's a good thing because God wants us to bear fruit. All of those things are scriptural and they're all good things. But here's the deal. None of them will save us. None of them. We are saved by the blood of Christ. And I think what was going on in the time Christ was on earth, the interaction he had with the Pharisees and Sadducees, those that, that John said did not receive him. I think what was going on was they were so prideful and convinced that their good deeds, their adherence to, to, to principles of, of law, and also just their prestige that they had achieved as being people of God and holy men in their culture, that that was good enough. And they really were unwilling to surrender to the fact that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and were once in darkness and can only be redeemed from that darkness by a loving and gracious God. Not by our own works. It is by grace you have been saved, is what the Apostle Paul said. So this is why I think this first point, as we talk about being anchored in the Savior, is so important. It's fundamental. We are anchored in the Savior not because we have achieved anything, we are anchored in the Savior because we have surrendered our rebellious spirit to God. And we have accepted this free gift of salvation that was poured out for us on the cross of Calvary. And I think if we don't start there, then we're not really firmly anchored. And many of the other issues that we might face in our walk with Christ are a result of not fully recognizing what we've received in Jesus and this salvation that he brought about on the cross of Calvary. So, uh, so first we choose Jesus. I think that's the message that, that John gives us here. Secondly, when we choose Jesus, we receive an inheritance. When we choose Jesus, we receive an inheritance. Now, at this point, if you're, if you're thinking critically about, what, about my sermon, uh, you might think, well, now wait a minute. You just spent 15 minutes telling me that salvation is a choice, that it's something I have to choose to receive. It's not because of my father, my mother, my grandparents, my great-grandparents. Now you're telling me that through Jesus I receive an inheritance. So which is it? Am I saved because of my faith in Jesus, or is it inheritance that I receive? Well, let me, let me clarify what I think I mean and what the Bible means by an inheritance. A couple of scriptures I want to look at. First of all, in our passage today, John uh, chapter 1, verse 12, there's a, there's a very important word there that, that I want to pull out. John says, yet to all who did receive him, right, those who accepted Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Okay? And I want to cue in on that word right, because what that's talking about is an inheritance, those who received Jesus and believed on his name, they had the right to be children of God. Not because of anything they had done. We're saved by grace, but it was an inheritance. Well, how did that work? Well, I think what the Bible tells us is that our inheritance comes when we accept Jesus because Jesus becomes our big brother through whom the inheritance comes. We are adopted into the family of God, and so we receive an inheritance. Let me give you another passage of Scripture just to kind of bring this into focus. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, the Hebrews writer says, Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. In other words, Jesus is the one who makes us holy. We are the ones who are made holy by his blood, and we're in the same family. And then the writer says, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Isn't that a great passage? 
That's why a lot of people say that Jesus is our big brother. I guess you could say he's our brother, but he's so much greater than we are. I think of him as my big brother, right? And he counts us as his brothers and his sisters. And, and this, to me, is, is really the, the crux of what it means to not only receive Jesus by grace, but to be bathed in this inheritance that he's given us now that we've been adopted into his kingdom. So let me, let me just give you a hypothetical situation. Let's say, for example, that you were born into an abusive family, right? So, so the family into which you were born was, they, had a, a, they were dysfunctional. Uh, there was an abuser, at least one in that family. And throughout your childhood, you were treated harshly. And you can pick any kind of abuse, but, but you were just treated harshly. It was, it was, it was a, a horrible place to live. And much of this was, was hidden from your school. It was hidden from the authorities because the people in your home who had authority over you were crafty, and they were able to, to hide what was actually going on in your home. But you, you knew what was going on. And you were bruised, and you were, you were broken on the inside, and, and your, your soul was was really forever wounded by what you were experiencing. And next to you was another family. It was a family that had learned that, that each one of them were made in the image of God. They weren't a perfect family, but they understood that there was someone who, who was greater than the circumstances that we face here on earth. And they actually were a family who knew the Lord Jesus and they had surrendered their life to him and they had confessed that they were sinners in need of grace and they had been delivered by God's grace and mercy. Again, they were not a perfect family, but they were coming from a very different point of view. They had no need to abuse and to, to hurt people. They were morally focused or more focused on, on trying to, to live out this grace that they had received. And so they would watch you leave in the morning. And they would see your tears. And they would hear the screaming in the house. And they would see the bruises and sometimes the cuts on your body. And, and it was no secret to them that something terrible was happening. And so they watched. And whenever possible, they would offer you a kind word or they would give you some food or some cookies or something to drink. And they would spend some time with you just to comfort you and to love on you. And then the inevitable happened. Something terrible unfolded in your home and you were abused to the point where it couldn't be hidden. The police were involved. They took you out of the home and they put you in foster care. And then your, your neighbors found out. And they, they interjected themselves in the foster care system and they appealed to be your foster parents and that was granted. And so, and so you came to live with your neighbors. And then they showered you with love and they, they showered you with grace and they gave you a, a, a kind of function that you had never seen in a family and, and your heart began to heal. And then those neighbors, they adopted you because they not only loved you, but they wanted you to be in their family. And so now your life has, has taken a complete turn and you've left the place where you were abused and you're living with this family that loves you and cares for you. It's an imperfect family, as all families are, but they are a family that knows it's made in the image of God and they've received Christ's grace and surrendered everything to them and to him. And so one day, you, you come out of this home to go to school. And as you leave this home where you have been adopted as a child, you just glance over at the home where you used to live. And, and all of a sudden, some memories rush into your mind. And you remember that as a place of darkness and, and, and pain and suffering. But now you know that you're adopted into this new family. And you don't have to go back. And you go to school and your life is changed. So if you can kind of picture that, I know it's hypothetical, but I do know that it happens at times. That's really what's happened now that we've received an inheritance. We were once in a, in a dysfunctional family where Satan was using our sins and our struggles to exploit us and to use us for his purposes. And God, in his rich mercy, pulled us out of that home. <laughs> and he covered us with grace through his son, Jesus Christ, who poured his blood out on the cross of Calvary. He adopted us into his family when we received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And now we no longer live in the dark, abusive place where Satan manipulates us 
and tries to destroy us. Now we live in the grace and mercy of God and in this relationship with Jesus. That's our inheritance. And everything that Jesus brings with him in this relationship with us is ours too. He is the Son of God. He has a relationship with the Father, and he gives us a new relationship with the Father. Jesus comes into our lives through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so this paraclete, this, this Holy Spirit who is our seal of salvation, is with us always. It is as if Christ is in us, as the Bible says, everywhere we go. And Jesus, as we'll mention in just a few moments, gives us eternal life because he is the eternal Son of God, and he pours that into us as well. And so we're in his family. We have his inheritance of salvation. Now, the beauty of the church is that we all have the same inheritance. Now, some of us have unique, different inheritances in life. Have you ever received an inheritance? And, you know, you don't have to raise your hand, but, but uh, we receive inheritances in life, and sometimes they're small, sometimes they're large. But we have unique inheritances here on earth. Uh, when my mother was... was dying and she was in the last few weeks uh, she i went to visit her and i went into the room and she said larry i want you to have that rocking chair now that rocking chair was a little little cherry rocking chair where my mom used to rock me when i was very sick as a child and she would stay up all night and she would would kind of pound on my back to break up the mucus that i had uh, to to really save my life and and to help me get some kind of rest from that. But she didn't get any rest, and it, it, she had to pay for that with her own health. But she remembered that, and I remembered that, and that rocking chair even had a broken runner on it. So every time she would rock, it would go... And she got that fixed, and I was so mad. She got that fixed, right? Because that's what I remembered about that rocker. And it, it was okay. Uh, needless to say, the rocker was really important to my mom and important to me. And so she said, Larry, take that rocker. Take it with you now on your way back. I said, Mom, <laughs> Mom, maybe I can do that later, but you're, I can't do that now. You're, you're alive, <laughs> and I don't want to take it. Now, I, I don't need it. What am I going to do with it? Take it with you. I said, no. So I left it until after my mom had, had passed away. But maybe you have something like that. It's something that was special to people in your family, and so it was given to you. And we all have unique inheritances in our homes in some way, in some place, in some fashion. But as the church, we all share the same inheritance. Every single one of us who counts Christ as our Lord, who is a part of the Lord's church, had the inheritance of salvation through his blood, the indwelling Holy Spirit, which is a seal of salvation and a comforter and a guide and a prompter, and we have the gift of eternal life, not only when we get to heaven, but eternal life is in us now. We have life that has been given to us by Christ. And I think that's, that's unique. I think that is something to be amazed at when we think of who we are as the church. It's a part of the bond that binds us together. You and I are anchored in Jesus, and we are anchored in Jesus as a church because we share together in the same inheritance. And just as we all have been made brothers and sisters of Jesus, we are all brothers and sisters of one another because we are in the body of the church and we are a part of the family of God. I found a quote by Rick Warren that, that kind of touched on this. I just wanted to, to share it with you uh, quickly. Rick Warren says, When we place our faith in Christ, God becomes our Father, we become His children, other believers become our brothers and sisters, and the church becomes our spiritual family. The family of God includes all believers in the past, the present, and the future. And so you have an inheritance. Now, one, one last thing before I leave this point and go to the, the third point. And that is, you have an inheritance that you can share with other people. And I love this, this great passage. This was a, a, a passage of scripture where Jesus had sent his disciples out to do ministry and so it was kind of a kind of a, a last comment that he gave them before they went out he said in matthew chapter 10 verse 8 freely you have received freely give and so the church is not a group of people that are selfishly holding on to this inheritance they've received we don't lock our inheritance up we don't hide our inheritance 
But in our daily lives and when people come through these doors, they see the love and mercy of Christ flowing through us because we are now connected to the Father through the blood of Jesus. They see the Holy Spirit bearing fruit in us because Christ is in us working the work of transformation and making us into the people that he wants us to be. And they see life in us where there's death and darkness and someone who knows Jesus and has a relationship with him and has received his grace comes into the picture. There is now life because we bring life and hope with us because of what we've received through Jesus and because we are anchored in him. And I believe as chaotic as this world might seem, Do you think the world seems chaotic at times, by the way? Maybe I should just ask you that. As confusing as this world might seem, I believe that the people of the Lord who are anchored in the Savior are the greatest hope that this world has. And so I just encourage you to take what you've been given, grasp this inheritance, rejoice in it, And let it flow from you and realize your inheritance is something to be shared. Freely you've received. Freely give the love of Jesus and the grace of God to others. Well, finally, and this is, of course, in in the scripture implied in my mind. And that is our inheritance in Jesus is inexhaustible. Our inheritance in Jesus is inexhaustible. So here, let me... Let me, let me tell you where I, where I get this point. In verse 12 and 13, again, John says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Right? Now, people who are born physically of, of parents here on earth, they, they have an exhaustible existence because we know that our bodies were not made to last forever. We know that one day our parents will, will pass away and they will hopefully be with the Lord if they've known Jesus. That's just a part of life. Everything in this life that's human is exhaustible. <laughs> Even the inheritance that you receive here in this life, it will, it will sooner or later be exhausted. Either if it's money, either inflation will eat it up or it'll all be spent. If it's, if it's a thing, it will eventually break or it'll be given to someone else. Earthly things and inheritances are exhaustible. But the things that come from God are inexhaustible. Remember that encounter that Jesus had with the woman at the well? Jesus said, if you'd known who I was, I would have given you what? Living water. And what did, what did this lady say? She said, well... Tell me about this living water, because if you give me living water, then I won't have to keep coming back to this well every day. That was exciting to her. And the living water he was talking about was this relationship with the Father that comes through the Son, where life pours into our lives hourly, momentarily, because of the grace that continues to pour in from God. So so this relationship that we're anchored in with Jesus is inexhaustible our inheritance is inexhaustible and that that's important to me because i don't know about you but sometimes i feel exhausted anyone here ever feel exhausted (laughs) physically when it's in the 90s outside you feel physically exhausted you got to make sure you stay hydrated emotionally when you're trying to deal with too many things at once you can be emotionally exhausted and spiritually when you feel as if maybe you're, you're, you've been beat up by Satan, <laughs> when you're disappointed in yourself because maybe you've, you've sinned and, and it wasn't what you want to do, or, or you have regrets or resentments or anger and you're having trouble forgiving, whatever, whatever those spiritual issues might be, if you spend too much time grappling with those yourself and trying to save yourself and trying to overcome them, you can just face exhaustion. But what Jesus offers is eternal grace, eternal mercy, eternal life, eternal connectedness, a relationship with the creator that nothing in this world can steal away. He offers that to us. His resources are inexhaustible. 
I was talking with a, a veteran the other day. I just want to share this with you before I kind of close. Uh, the veteran was a Marine in, uh, in a recent conflict in another place in the world. He is at a point in his life now where much of his mobility has been taken away. He has a plate in his back. He's blind in one eye. Uh, he told me that many of his injuries came uh, because he was in the barrack in Beirut in the 80s. Remember that terrible event where a couple of trucks loaded with explosives came to the barrack and it blew up and, and uh, over 200 Marines lost their lives. Uh, many over, much over 200 Marines lost their lives. Well, he was there. And while he didn't lose his life, he was, he was blown several feet away from the explosion and he was injured badly. And here's what he said. He said, you know, my body's used up. He said, there, I'm, I'm just facing all these physical issues and, and I, I've just given everything physically for my country. But then he said, even as my body is used up, and a lot of it doesn't function anymore. He said, God's mercy and God's strength continues to fill up my life. And somehow, some way, God is giving this man the strength spiritually that he needs to endure the dissipation of his physical strength. And I think the Apostle Paul talked about that once when he talked about how he was wasting away while the body was getting weaker, the presence of God's grace and mercy in his life was getting stronger. And I think that's what happens when you're anchored in the Savior. Even in times of chaos, even in times of turmoil, even when you feel depleted in almost every other area of your life, if you're anchored in the Savior and you grasp the significance of this inheritance that you have in him, this living water that flows into your life, you can continue to, to, to feast on the hope and on the glory and the grace and love of God that comes through your relationship with Jesus. Now, I hadn't planned on this until yesterday, but for some reason, my, my brain often takes these little roads here, there, and yonder. I thought of a time when I was a kid and we were eating dinner with some missionary kids actually my parents were eating dinner with their parents and the kids were just all thrown together but somehow we ended up in the garage and we were trying to figure out well let's let's put on a show for our parents let's do something for them and here's what we came up with you might think this is kind of corny but i mean we were coming from these ministry homes and so i guess it was wonderful and we finally came up with this idea we would sing a hymn <laughs> we, we would we would go out in front of our parents tell them we had a show and we would sing a hymn and so we looked through the hymn book that was out in the garage and we, we picked out a hymn. And, and I remember that event and I remember the hymn. And here's, here's how it went. In times like these, does that ring a bell? You need a savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Y'all ever heard this? Okay. Let me sing the chorus. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Isn't that a beautiful song? And isn't that the message? Be anchored in the Savior. And in this chaotic, tumultuous, confusing, sometimes hurtful world, make sure that you hold strongly and fast to the anchor and if you do your anchor Jesus Christ will keep you firmly anchored in the rock of salvation and in your relationship with God 
At this time, we're going to spend just a moment around the Lord's table and uh, take communion. And I believe one of the reasons that Jesus wanted his disciples to share in this supper with him was to remind them where their anchor was. <laughs> he said, remember this, remember me when you do this until I come again. And that was a long time. That was 2,000 years ago. He still hasn't returned. So Jesus knew that, that, that there were many days ahead when, when his believers would need to hold fast to the anchor and remember what he did for them. And so that's what we do now. We remember that Jesus, sent by God, who was rich in mercy and love, gave his body on the cross as a substitute for us. And we take this bread, remembering his body. And then we remember that his blood was shed on the cross as a payment for our sins. We might try through our human pride to save ourselves, to do spiritual things and good deeds, thinking that will save us. And while those things are good, they do not save us. The blood of Christ saves us because it was God's payment for our sin. And so we take this juice to remember. Today, if you have a need in your life, a prayer need, if there's something that you, you just need to talk with someone about, uh, you, of course, can talk to anyone at any time, but I just want to create a, an opportunity and a space as we close the service, I'll be sitting on the front row. If you have a prayer need, just walk up and just just nudge me and talk with me, and I'll make sure that there's someone here at the church, an elder, a uh, church member that follows up, and you have a chance to talk some more. Uh, most eternally important, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never received this gift that Christ gives, this gift of grace, we invite you to, to make that decision if you're ready. Or if you're not ready to, to seek that decision, and if you'd like to talk about a decision to make Jesus your Savior, to, to be baptized in his name, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and this inheritance that he offers, then I invite you to do the same thing. Just come up and nudge me and, and we'll talk and, and I'll make sure that there's a follow-up and someone for you to, to have more conversation with. We invite you to come. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I thank you for this, this gift of salvation through your son Jesus that we did not have to stay in darkness. We didn't have to remain in, a, in an abused home where Satan was exploiting us and, and destroying us for his purposes. But you adopted us out of that place and you gave us an inheritance and you filled us with your Holy Spirit and you gave us the promise of eternal life. And so we thank you for those things, Father, and I pray that you'll help us to to live out this inheritance and to use it to bless others, even as we look to you, our hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Thrown into the midst of the sea. 